Well, hello. Uh, welcome to this special seminar of the Roundtable on Black Men and Black Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine. I'm Dr. Kato Lorenzen, and we are here to discuss COVID-19 and vaccines and questions of particular importance to the Black community. Um, I chair the National Academy of Sciences Roundtable on Black Men and Black Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine. The roundtable consists of almost 40 leaders from medicine, engineering, science, industry, and philanthropy. We started the roundtable over a year ago to tackle the difficult issues facing Black people in science, engineering, and medicine. Our vision was to create a trusted source for the Black community and for the world on a range of issues imp impacting Black people. The roundtable has been hard at work and has addressed issues ranging from racism in academics, the COVID-19 pandemic in Black people, and the educational pipeline for Blacks from pre-K to graduate education, just to name a few of our topics. Today, our goal is to provide frank, reliable information on the COVID-19 vaccine. This webinar is, is particularly directed to the black community, which has long had very justified questions of trust in medicine and also in the medical enterprise. I am joined by four distinguished members of the round table. They are all physician leaders who have worked at the forefront of issues facing uh, blacks in medicine science and engineering. Let me introduce them to you. First of all, I am a Dr. Kayla Lorenzen. I'm the university professor and Albert and Wilda Van Dusen, Distinguished Endowed Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Connecticut. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Connecticut Convergence Institute at UConn. And I am an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering. Dr. Hannah Valentine, MD, is our moderator for this webinar. And she is professor of medicine at Stanford University. And she served as the first NIH chief officer of scientific workforce, workforce diversity. She is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Dr. Cedric Bright, MD, is professor of internal medicine and the Associate Dean for Admissions and Interim Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion at the Brody School of Medicine in Greenville, North Carolina. He served as the 112th President of the National Medical Association. Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones, MD, MPH, PhD, just completed her tenure as the Evelyn Green Davis Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. She is a past president of the American Public Health Association. And then finally, Dr. Clyde Yancey, MD, is the Magristad Professor of Medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. He is the Chief of Cardiology Medicine at Northwestern Memorial Hospital and he is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine. Now our format is as follows. We will have, we'll first have a video describing my experience with the COVID-19 vaccine that will set the stage for our discussions. Next, our moderator, Dr. Valentine, will take over and engage this distinguished panel with a question and answer session. We've chosen questions that we have commonly heard, uh, questions that our patients ask us, questions that our colleagues ask us, and, and our neighbors have asked us, and our family. The hope is that this webinar will serve to be extremely useful to the Black community in answering questions regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. At the outset, let me say that we believe that Black people should proceed and receive the COVID-19 vaccine. We all have. Mm -hmm. We understand, however, there are important questions that people have. And we are here today 
to provide some of the answers. We'll start with the video. The coronavirus disease pandemic has had a terrible and long-lasting impact on the world. As the infection spreads, the projected mortality and economic devastation are unprecedented. From the pandemic's infancy, my team and I foresaw the challenges this virus would create for Blacks in particular. We published the first peer-reviewed paper on COVID-19 and the Black community, entitled The COVID-19 Pandemic, A Call to Action to Identify and Address Racial and Ethnic Disparities. This paper was the first to provide definitive data showing higher rates of COVID-19 related infections and deaths in Blacks in America. According to the CDC, as of December 6, 2020, in total there have been over 20 million cases and over 365,000 deaths from the virus in the United States. A further dive into these numbers shows that our initial hypothesis has been unfortunately true. Blacks have suffered tremendously and disproportionately from this virus. The racial and ethnic disparities in the effects of COVID-19 are striking. According to APM Research Lab, Blacks are experiencing COVID-19 death tolls exceeding 1 in 800 nationally, while white Americans are experiencing death tolls at 1 in 3,125 nationally. Blacks have COVID-19 death rates of more than 2.7 times white Americans. Access to health information to educate the Black community on vaccines is key. Thus, I am here today to personally advocate for Black people to proceed with the vaccine. I've been a consultant for Johnson & Johnson, helping them with their vaccine work. Right now, that vaccine is not available, but the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are available. I think we should obtain any vaccine that is available right now. I am getting the Pfizer vaccine. Today, I will receive my second dose of the Pfizer vaccine. I invite you to follow me through the process and the aftermath. Okay, I just had my uh, second uh, Pfizer shot. It's about 30 minutes afterwards, and I feel good. I uh, don't feel dizzy, no soreness right now, although I think I'll probably get some soreness later. And uh, we'll see uh, how we do at uh, the next stop in 24 hours. Racism and its subsequent effects on social and economic factors have resulted in the virus disproportionately affecting black people. Our first peer-reviewed paper on COVID-19 stated that blacks are disproportionately affected by poverty, mass incarceration, infant mortality, limited health act care access, and health-related conditions, including heart disease, diabetes, stroke, kidney disease, respiratory illness, and the human immunodeficiency virus. We are also more likely to contract the virus and spread it within our communities because we are less likely to be able to work from home and physically distance ourselves due to living, working, and commuting. Again, all of these factors have historical roots in racism and segregation that have been consciously and unconsciously carried out for decades, and to this day, creating direct and indirect negative effects on blacks. Given the fact that the virus has hit the black community the hardest, I am concerned now that vaccine hesitancy may perpetuate the health disparities that we are currently seeing in the numbers of infections and deaths taking place. Most studies, for instance, at this point, have found blacks as a community have the highest levels of individuals who state they will never get the vaccine or are not sure if they will get the vaccine. Many studies have noted that black people cite distrust in the government and in the medical profession. Black people cite our nation's history of racism in medical research and in medical care as key reasons for their hesitancy. This mistrust is totally justified. Well, hello, I'm uh, Dr. Cato Lorenzen, and uh, this is now day one after my second shot of the uh, Pfizer vaccine. I'm here with uh, Dr. Neb Osmond, uh, my uh, third year uh, orthopedic surgery resident, who is a uh, star resident, who is a graduate of uh, Mount Sinai, and also uh, Jason Esdale, who is a uh, fourth year uh, uh, a medical student who is spending a year with me doing research and seeing patients and, and being all that he can be. And, um, and so right now, how do I feel? I think that uh, right now I've got some shoulder discomfort and shoulder pain. My, I, would, I would grade the pain after, uh, after the injection right now, one day out, about four out of 10. Um, if I move my shoulder about 20 degrees, I have no pain because my rotator cuff is firing. Uh, after I'm over 30 degrees, I move my shoulder and actually has pain because my deltoid is firing. It's sort of uh, it just you know, getting the physiology and, and sort of correlating with that. 
uh, the, the important thing is I have had no chills, no fever, um, no muscle aches right now. Um, I had some muscle aches after the first injection, but none, but none after this. And so in general, I feel very good. And uh, I'm here again, I'm seeing patients and so uh, today, so I must be feeling good. And uh, so um, overall, the results have been, have been good. And I, again, I'm an advocate and supporter of uh, vaccination for, uh, for COVID-19. I think that, uh, that everyone who has the opportunity should, uh, should do it. And I'll be back with you tomorrow to talk to you about, uh, about how I'm doing at that point. Well, hello, uh, I'm Dr. Kay Lorenzen, the Van Dusen Professor of Orthopedic Surgery. Yesterday, I was in uh, my, uh, my clinic, in my clinical offices, seeing patients. And today, I'm in my uh, research laboratory, Lorenzen Laboratories, here at the University of Connecticut. As you remember, uh, on Tuesday, two days ago, I um, actually had my second shot of the uh, Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and I'm here to report uh, how I'm doing. I'm joined today with uh, two of my star postdoctoral fellows, uh, Dr. Kenyatta Washington, who's on my left, and also Dr. Chinadu Ude, who's on my right. They, uh, they're training with me in science and we're pushing back uh, the frontiers of science and making new discoveries every day at, uh, at the Connecticut Convergence Institute. Well, um, at this point, uh, again, we're now at uh, day two and um, I'm uh, feeling, continue to feel better. I had, uh, I slept on my, uh, on my right side, I had my right shoulder injected, and I slept on my right side for the first time last night. And uh, today, as you remember, yesterday I was able to move my arm to about 30 degrees, which meant I was firing my, my mainly my rotator cuff. Um, but now I'm able to go to about 90, 100 degrees in terms of moving my arm without that much uh, discomfort. And that's a big, uh, big improvement and big change from yesterday. No fevers, no chills, actually no rash. Uh, so, uh, so I think I'm uh, doing fairly well after uh, day two of the uh, of the uh, uh, vaccine injection, and again, I want to recommend to everyone, uh, especially those in the black community, to uh, to get the COVID-19 uh, uh, injection. Uh, it doesn't matter what uh, you know what uh, um, what company you use. There's um, obviously there's Pfizer, which is the one I received, and also Moderna, AstraZeneca will be coming out with one, and also um, Johnson and Johnson will be coming out with its vaccine. And so I think it's very, very important that uh, we in the community uh, proceed and, and get that vaccine. All right, well, take care, and I'll have uh, one more update uh, t uh, tomorrow at, uh, at home. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, I'm Dr. Kayla Lorenzen. I'm the university professor and Albert Wilde Van Dusen Distinguished Endowed Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Connecticut. And this is now day three after having my second injection of the COVID-19 vaccine. I had the, the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. I'm joined uh, by on the my immediate uh, right by my very beautiful and intelligent uh, wife, uh, Cynthia Lorenzen. And, uh, and then my far right, I'm joined by uh, my you know, very beautiful, intelligent, and super smart uh, daughter, Victoria Lorenzen, who is a junior at uh, Princeton University studying biology. Um, so as you know, I had the, uh, this is now day three from since my, uh, since my uh, vaccine injection and I feel great. I uh, was able to sleep on my right side yesterday without uh, any problem, got the injection on my right side. And, um, and now I have full motion of my shoulder, in my shoulders, no pain whatsoever. So I've had no major side effects in terms of no rash, no fever, no chills. Uh, and uh, and no headache, and so again, I uh, think this is something that everyone should take, particularly in the black community. We've been hit so hard with in terms of numbers of COVID uh, cases, numbers of COVID nineteen deaths, and particularly in terms of our community, we need to proceed. And, and I and uh, so I, I want to make sure it's very clear that I hundred percent recommend that we all uh, get the COVID nineteen uh, 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 vaccine when it's available to us. So take care. Yes. Bye bye. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, at this point, I'd like to turn over the webinar to Dr. Hannah Valentine. Dr. Valentine. Thank you very much, Dr. Lorenzen. I'd like to take a moment to share the context of why I am personally uh, excited and committed to doing this webinar um, for the, with the National Academies and my colleagues here. 
early state vaccination data has raised warning flags for racial equity. As of January 19, vaccination patterns by race and ethnicity appear to be at odds with who the virus has affected the most. Based on vaccinations with known race ethnicity data, the share of vaccinations among black people is smaller than their share of cases in all of the 16 reporting states and smaller than their share of deaths in 15 states. For example, in Mississippi, black people account for 15% of the vaccinations compared to 38% of COVID-19 cases and wait for this, 42% of deaths. And in Delaware, 8% of the vaccinations have been received by black people while they make up nearly a quarter of cases, 24% of deaths. Similarly, Hispanic people account for smaller share of vaccinations compared to their share of cases and deaths. Together, these data raise early warning flags about potential racial disparities in access to and uptake of the vaccine. Now, as members of the National Academies Roundtable addressing health and biomedical issues for African-Americans, we are here as a group of physicians and scientists to answer some of the many questions that are being asked by our communities. So let's get started. First of all, by show of hands, how many of my colleagues around the table have received the COVID-19 vaccination? Raise your hand. Great. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask a particular question which I've heard, which is gets to what is the real ground truth about the COVID-19 vaccination? Does it work in minority populations, in racial ethnic groups? What really is the evidence that it works? It is effective at preventing us from getting this devastating disease. And to answer that, I've asked Dr. Yancey, who was already introduced to you, to really walk us through what do we actually know? What is the truth around vaccine efficacy? Dr. Yancey, take it away. Well, Hannah, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be a part of this webinar, and I'm delighted to specifically address the question of what do we know about the vaccine in Blacks? I'd like to first though continue a theme that my colleagues, Dr. Laurentian and Dr. Valentin started. I am personally invested in this because some of the most egregious evidence of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on Blacks has emanated from my now home city of Chicago and was also emanating from my former home city of New Orleans. Black people have suffered from this condition. And thus it really is important to participate in this webinar and convey information that might help us reduce this burden going forward. So I'm going to talk to you right now about this very real problem, questioning whether or not we know how the vaccine works. So look at what I'm going to share with you first. This is profound. This is like nothing we've seen in contemporary medicine. Within the last 12 months, we've seen the identification of the genes that lead to the novel coronavirus, which was responsible for COVID-19. And remarkably, we've seen the development of a vaccine, the testing and the emergency use authorization to deploy the vaccine. Now, I've just said a lot of things very quickly. Let me deconstruct that. First, for all of you who say, boy, that was so fast, how can we trust that? Well, it wasn't quite as fast as you think. Dating back to 2003, 2004, 
when we dealt with the MERS virus and the, SAR, the first SARS virus, it became evident in the public health community that we were likely going to face a virus that would have outsized pandemic level impacts. We have faced that. Several years ago, beginning in about 2013, some very appropriate scientists working closely with the NIH started thinking about a novel way to rapidly develop a virus. And what emerged was targeting the RNA. You've heard that one of the vaccine companies is called Moderna. That name comes from modern RNA, meaning that the modern way to make a vaccine is by targeting the RNA. That's right, the name of that company uniquely talks about how to develop this vaccine. The other thing you might not appreciate, all of those years of scientific discovery, this great evidence just sitting on a shelf, came to fruition as soon as the science community heard about the vaccine in China, and especially once the DNA was made available. Here's a startling observation. In the laboratory, they were already able to make the first copy of the vaccine eight days before the first case appeared in the United States. That is truly remarkable by applying this science. And here's the name that I want you to have said you've heard, Kazimikia Corbett. This is an emerging star African-American scientist, a woman working in the Graham lab, who was charged with the responsibility of taking the DNA from this novel coronavirus and in developing this vaccine and fully executed this, again, eight days before the first case appeared in the state of Washington. Now, let me show you what these wiggles and curves mean. There's one curve that is blue, and it looks as if you're rising up a mountain slope. There's another curve that's red. It starts with the blue curve, but immediately breaks away at seven days. That's the horizontal line and stays that way throughout 28 days and beyond. That blue line that continues to go up and up represents the percent of people in this trial developing COVID-19 on placebo. The red line represents the people who received the actual vaccine. This kind of abrupt change, we call this in science inflection point, is unheralded. This is why we can say with conviction that these vaccines are 95% effective when we see this kind of striking decrease in the likelihood of developing COVID-19. But there's more that I want to share with you on this next graphic. But what about Black Shuniqui? That's what you want to know. Were we included in these studies and how did this vaccine work in us? And so the first question is yes we were included. The second horizontal line you see this labeled Black African-American demonstrates that 9% of the people in this 30,000 patient trial were Black. That 9% is amongst the best representation that we see in any trial in medicine, any test of a new therapeutic in medicine, because our percent representation in the population is only 12 or 13 to have 9% in a trial, that's probably two to threefold higher than we usually see in the trial. So they made an overt effort to bring black people into the study. So the first thing I can tell you is that black people were appropriately represented in the trial. But here's the next thing I can tell you. If you look at how the vaccine worked, again, look at the second row of information for black or African-American, you see a zero. That means in the Blacks that received vaccine, no Black person developed COVID-19. And if you move your eye to the far right, where we look at the percent success, 100% successful. We call this efficacy, but 100% in Blacks in this trial. Now, to be fair, maybe this will or will not be realized when it is used across the board in all comers. But we can at least say with conviction 
that in this study, one, Blacks were included. Two, the response in Blacks was at least as good as everyone else and may have been amongst the best response. And three, overall, for everyone in the trial and for all of us in the community, this vaccine worked. How it will work long-term, those are questions yet to be known. How it will work against the new variations of the novel coronavirus, COVID-19, we believe it will continue to work, but this is going to take further study. But this is the best tool we have right now to really attenuate what has been a devastating effect of COVID-19 in the Black community. Dr. Valentine, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for that wonderful presentation and most compelling and actually most encouraging from my perspective, quite frankly. However, we know a lot about science. We know a lot about these research studies that promise so much. And yet on the other hand, we hear this continual turmoil and churn of the rumor mill about so many issues. For example, can the vaccine alter my own DNA? Can the vaccine alter my fertility? And even can someone get COVID-19 from the vaccine itself? I'm going to ask Dr. Cato Lorenzen to address those kind of rumor mill uh, issues that continue to bother everyone, including people in our Black community. Cato. Well, well thank you very much, uh, Dr. Valentine. Uh, let me just make a, uh, I just need to make a brief, uh, first of all, this is a, a wonderful presentation by Dr. Yancey, and I want to congratulate him on that. I also want to just underscore the fact that this is fairly historic. We have a vaccine that had Black people, Black scientists, involved in developing we vaccine technology, broad technology, that had Black people involved in developing. We had a clinical trial, and I sat on the science board for the FDA uh, and constantly talked about the fact that we have clinical trials which have, that, are for, that are geared toward Black people that had no Black people in them. But this, this, in this clinical trial, we have substantial numbers of Black people in the clinical trials. And third is that we have a body. We've established a body like the round table on Black men and Black women in science, engineering, and medicine. It's a standing body, uh, not an assembled group that's assembled just for this, but a standing body that can stop and review the data, that can say, wait a minute, we want to see the data, we want to see the information, and can impartially look at the information and data and say, okay, um, there's evidence that's there. So this is really historic on, on the three levels in terms of in terms of what we were able to achieve. Now, in terms of Rumor Central, we've all heard the, the rumors, some of the rumors. Um, and one question is, uh, can the vaccine alter my, my own DNA? And the answer is no, uh, the, it, the, the vaccines don't work that way. Uh, some have asked me, and my a couple of patients have asked me, can I, can, can I get COVID-19 from the vaccine itself? And the answer is no, because the vaccine doesn't work that way. Um, uh, rumor, another rumor was that can the vaccine alter my fertility? Um, and the answer is, at least as far as we know, no. The clinical trials found no difference in fertility with people who got the vaccine uh, and that those who got a placebo. And, um, and so I think that some of the answers uh, that, uh, that we have, and part of the reason why we're here, uh, is to really dispel the rumors in terms of these different areas. And so as far as we know, and as far as the information that we've, that we've gotten from the clinical trials and also in the follow-up that we've had so far, um, these are rumors and, and we, we can dispel them uh, with our comments today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lorenzen. Anybody else wants to chime in on these rumor mills that, um, and um, misinformation, I would actually say they are? Um, uh, on this topic. Dr. Valentine, it's not a rumor mill, but part of the thing, part of the work profile that I've had over the last week has been to go from one morning huddle to the next in my own hospital. 
despite the research that we're doing and the leadership we have, our own data tell us that amongst the 33,000 vaccinations we've given to healthcare workers in our large healthcare system, employees of color, the rate is down to 30%. Mm -hmm. And so I've personally been going down to the loading dock, to central supply, mm -hmm. working with the medical assistants, because they're the ones that have the greatest ambivalence and don't believe this is appropriate. So the questions aren't exactly ruining those. You know what? They're quite appropriate. Why does it require two shots? Why does it hurt? How long will it last? What about these new viruses that I'm hearing? And how did you develop it so fast? And what will happen to me two years from now, three years from now? Never ever discount the question of anybody because they're quite insightful. And the more we've engaged in these conversations, the better. I had my clinic today and I was struck when one of the persons who was in one of these huddles I did this week came to the clinic with mask on and said, thank you for helping me understand what's involved. No one had spoken to us. No one had educated us. No one wanted us to know what was going on. They just said, go take the vaccine. And we don't want people telling us to do things without telling us why. So it's not a rumor mill, but I think it's an explanation for why behaviors are like they are. That's fantastic. And, and thank you for emphasizing that, Dr. Yancey. Um, people are really concerned because they don't have answers. And I find that when people don't ans have answers, they fill in the blanks. And so that's why we are here as a trusted voice to be able to explain and answer the questions. I would actually add, um, I agree entirely with Dr. Yancey that it's not on us to coax or convince people or cajole people into taking the vaccine. We need to hear people's questions, answer them. And the evidence on the vaccines that we have so far is so uh, compelling. They are so effective. And everything that we know about the safety profile says that they are safe. So um, what we want is for people to to ask their questions. Right now we have questions that we're going to answer, but there'll be other questions that arise as the vaccine uh, gets rolled out, as the virus potentially changes. There's so many things. And so it would be really good for people when they have questions uh, to have a source that they can ask those questions of. And I don't know if my other panelists would make suggestions. I mean, if you have a primary care physician, ask that person first. If you have a pharmacist or anything, but the worst thing to do would be to hear something and rather than checking it out, to spread a rumor that might discourage other people from even asking a question or certainly from taking the vaccine. So we don't want to be spreading rumors. We want to have our questions because our questions are important and we need to get them answered. Is there any uh, recommendation from you all about especially if people don't have a primary care physician, how should they approach getting answers? They can look online and hopefully a lot of the stuff will be accurate, but maybe it won't. So where should people go? So this is a great question. Um, I, I do think that this educational piece that you raise is so important. And I would ask the question, to what extent are primary physicians conversant with this kind of information? And I hope that this webinar will be disseminated also to other physicians so that they can answer the questions. Now, the issue of where to go is a really good one. And I will turn it over to uh, others um, on, the, on the panel to, to comment, but going on the websites doesn't necessarily give you the correct answer. There's a lot of stuff up there that is just frankly incorrect. There, there is a lot of stuff, but I, I think that the CDC website um, is, a, is a good source of information. Um, I saw a, uh, actually a study, I think it was done uh, by the Pew Foundation, which um, spoke to the fact that um, you know, Blacks are actually very, very adherent to a number of the guidelines as set, uh, as, as set forward uh, by the uh, by the CDC, and so which is very important because um, the blacks have, have looked at these guidelines 
they adhere to these guidelines to a greater extent than whites do, which means that the questions about, you know, whether to get the COVID-19 vaccine or not, are not by, you know, by, you know, moving into a corner and saying, I'm not doing it. They, you know, Blacks are very intelligent about these issues, adhere to guidelines of CDC, are curious about the facts, are curious about the data, very intelligent about, about these issues. And the questions don't, you know, the questions reflect actually a high level of understanding of issues, not a low level of understanding of issues. And so I think it's important to underscore that. So, but I think that the CDC website is a very, very good central trusted source uh, to be able to be used in the internet now, of course, with Facebook, internet, everything is, is there's so much information, but that, that's one area I would, I would recommend. Yeah, I, I would I would support that to the CDC um, and things that come out of, you know, um, trusted sources, I, I think is um, uh, valuable and, and, and based on science, not on opinion. And I have one more thing that I'd like to say. So the surveys that indicate that there's some vaccine hesitancy in black communities, the first one, for example, from the Kaiser Family Foundation indicated that perhaps 35% of black folks weren't sure they would take it right away. But in that same survey, 42% of Republicans said the same thing, 42%, more than the 35%, 42% of rural people did. And yet you don't hear the news pounding so much on Republican vaccine hesitancy or rural vaccine hesitancy. Mm -hmm. Clearly black folks do have a justified, uh, you know, mm -hmm. skepticism about a lot of things because in our history, there's so many things that have been done to us and upon us and all. But I don't think that we should glorify vaccine hesitancy in the black community. We should meet it and answer the questions. So because, it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy and that would be the biggest shame. Absolutely. So while you're on the floor, uh, Dr. Jones, there is one particular issue that I would like you to comment on, which is a question that I hear often. After I've been fully vaccinated, do I really have to keep wearing my mask and social distancing? What is all that about? Tell me more about this, Dr. Jones. Well, so the simple answer is yes. Yes, we all need to be wearing our masks, social distancing, hand washing, avoiding contact with people outside our house, household, all of that until the whole pandemic has weighed down. There are many reasons for that. First of all, these amazing vaccines, these mRNA vaccines manufactured by Pfizer and by Moderna um, are 95% effective. That means that even if you're fully vaccinated, there is an off chance that you still could get infected. Now you probably you probably wouldn't get it as bad as somebody else might get it, but but you still could get infected. But the bigger question is, can you pass it on to someone else? And these clinical trials were not set up to answer that question, not yet. So it is possible that the vaccines keep you from having symptoms right? They certainly keep you from going into the hospital. They certainly keep you from dying, right? But they may not keep you from having enough infection in your nose and in your mouth that if you were to speak or cough or sneeze, that it could get to somebody else. So we need to wear our mask. Wearing our mask is not primarily to protect us in the first place. It's to protect those around us. So, so that is the right reason. Also, because this virus is spreading so much, every time this virus spreads from one person to another, it can change, it can mutate. And we have started hearing about these variants, the United Kingdom, the UK variant. We've heard about the South African variant, Brazil variant. There are many variants that we're hearing about. And as far as we know, the vaccines that are out there right now do protect against those variants as well. But what we need to do is be aware that as long as this pandemic is raging, as long as there continues to be lots and lots of spread, there will be more variants. So we all have to be very careful when, whenever we're out and about. This is a great um, presentation. You've sort of really, in a way, covered the whole spectrum of everything that we need to do. Uh, and this session is actually very much focused at the vaccine, 
But the take home message I'm hearing from you is that it's vaccine plus. There's a lot of other things that need to be done that we mustn't uh, keep uh, forgetting about. But I wanna underscore one point that you made, which is causing a little bit of worry in the community is these new strains and will the vaccine be effective on these new strains? And from what we see, the answer is yes. So that's very encouraging. I, I would like to sort of underscore that. And as we just uh, move on to another question that I um, frequently hear, um, and it's a really um, insightful one, and it's the, fa the, the situation where a person has already had COVID-19. And the question often posed is, well, I've had COVID-19, should I get a vaccine? After all, I may have already the antibodies needed to protect me. And how long should I wait to get the vaccine after I've been in, uh, infected? So Dr. Bright, who has been very quiet with us here, is going to help us tackle that question. Dr. Bright. Well, thank you, Dr. Valentine. I, I certainly have been quiet because I'm listening <laughs> to my compadres tell the truth and I didn't have anything to add. So I decided I would be quiet. So that is a great question that you just proposed. And, and looking at the data from what we have, uh, we do suggest that people get the vaccine after they've had COVID. Uh, we do not know how long the antibodies from the actual infection last in the body, but we do think that it does confer some type of immunity for at least up to 90 days. We are suggesting at that particular point is when somebody should consider receiving the vaccines after about 90 days after they have had the COVID infection. That is the recommendation at this particular time. Thank you. Are you, are you finding your patients are also asking you these, that kind of question? It's a tough one. Yeah, it's a tough question. And, and, but more importantly, it's a fair question. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we need to be able to hear these questions and ask to understand where the questions are coming from and to validate the concerns of the people that raise these questions. And then most importantly, find an answer. And if we don't know an answer, let us be honest about that and say, we don't know the answer, but we're, going to, we're still researching it and we may find out soon the, the answer to that question. Great. So Dr. Valentine, if I may. Yes. Dr. Bright brings up a really important point. If you think about why we're having this conversation, we're trying to save lives, but we're also trying to restore our life and living circumstances that have been so profoundly impacted for the past year. This is a little bit in Dr. Jones' space, but if we are to be able to converse and travel and congregate freely, we need the majority of the population to be protected from COVID-19. There's only two ways that can happen. You either have immunity, which for our lay audience means you're either protected because you've had COVID-19 and your own natural defenses have developed an antibody response, or you've been given the vaccine and the vaccine has generated an antibody response. Mm -hmm. When we add the two together, it needs to get to about 65 or 70%. If we get to that level, then that question you raised earlier, Dr. Valentine, when can we relax? When can we go to church again? When can we go to Friday night football again? When can we have a picnic again? When can we get rid of the mask? Probably not soon with the mask, but getting together means that a sufficient portion of the population has taken steps or has recovered from COVID so that in general, we're protected. Because when we get too deep in the weeds answering the specific questions about the vaccine, it's important that we double back and say, okay, why are we doing this to begin with? Because we want to be part of what we typically would describe as life and living. I hesitate, I hesitate to call it normal because for black people, what we were experiencing wasn't normal. We need to move towards a new normal, yes. but to get out yes. and about, we need everyone as much as possible to get to this next level. 
excellent point. Um, excellent point. And for a related question, and this is this is even more difficult to address: is how long will the vaccine effects last? For how long am I protected, so that we can feel comfortable? doing exactly the things that you just listed, Dr. Yancey. Anybody want to take that on? I'll just keep my train of thought going because yeah, yeah. we've already developed a pattern of behavior for annual flu vaccination. No one even blinks an eye. We wait for the new vaccine to come and we go to the local drugstore. It's free. We get the immunization. And so, so what if it only lasts a year? If that's what it takes to bring this down to some quiet level, most of us believe it'll never get to zero, by the way. But if we can get this down to some quiet level, and it means that we now have a platform to develop vaccines, so-called plug and play, where we can just continue to modify the vaccine, that's our new, that's our new lifestyle. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Dr. Yancey. The other part of that, though, is, is the model of the hepatitis vaccine for which we get booster. We got three different shots for the hepatitis right. vaccine, and that confers an immunity for a lifetime. So uh, we're still new with this vaccine technology, and we don't know whether this is going to give us an, a lifetime Im immunity or this will be a seasonal phenomenon. Certainly, as we continue to have variants, if the variants are become more uh, powerful such that the vaccine that we have in play now doesn't cover it, we would definitely have to have new renditions of the vaccine covering those new variants, a la what we would do with the flu every year. I mean, every year we change different valence parts on the flu vaccine in order to think to meet what we think is going to be the strain of the flu that's going to come out that year. So you're right. We already have a custom in place where we're used to getting vaccinations for these types of things, influenza. This will just probably become another one of those that we will have in the future that will probably maybe become yearly. The other yeah, thing let me, get, let me just about. add one thing, and, 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 that's, and that's the fact that this, and when we talk about the flu vaccine, um, and we talk about, and we talk about the flu, we talk about COVID-19, as I've once said, and I, I'm dating myself by saying this, this isn't your father's Oldsmobile. Uh, this isn't your average, you know, your average uh, virus that's here. Um, when we think about the seasonal flu, there's a seasonal flu. The season for COVID is 365 days a year. And that's what we're finding out. There, there, I think there was someone in the very beginning said, sometime in the summer, this is just all going to go away. <laughs> no, right. This is a 365 days. We're seeing variants and we're seeing just a tons of different variants that are coming out. And this is the first year we're seeing COVID-19. So I completely agree. I do believe that we will need to have either a booster, certainly a booster or, you know, some sort of new vaccine on a yearly basis, because this is, uh, this is not your average, uh, you know, uh, you know, virus that, that, that we're facing and we'll need to combat it. But it's also very, very important that we get ahead of this in terms of the black community. We, you know, we've had the situation before. We've had, to, we've been there, done that. We've got the T-shirt in terms of HIV. We're now 45% of individuals with HIV, the HIV virus, are, are from the black community every year. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we get ahead of this because we don't want this to become something that is centered in the black community in terms of the future. Absolutely. I couldn't that's agree right. more. That's why we're all here. And that's why we're all, quite frankly, extremely concerned. And we mustn't let our brothers and sisters get left behind in this one. And so, there, um, there are just a few points I want to pick up. It's been such a stimulating conversation. The first, when Dr. Yancey, you talked about two ways to get immunity, either get the COVID or get the vaccine. Getting the COVID is the much worse way to get immunity. Yes. <laughs> okay, so I just want to say that that if you get COVID, you might die, but even if you don't die and you recover, you don't, so many people are not fully recovering. Okay. They are they are tired, they have brain fog. We don't know what the long-term side effects of having gone through a COVID uh, infection and then surviving are, right? So the best way to get immunity is to get the vaccine. That We're so clear on that. The other thing is that, um, 
herd immunity. So Dr. Yancey said, you know, and the early estimates were 65 to 70 percent of the population. That number is actually estimated based on how easy it is for the virus to go from one to the other and how long it takes for it to double, the doubling time. This virus right now that we have, now it's like 75 to 80, but when you get these other variants that are more infectious, easier to spread, it means that a higher and higher percent of the population is actually going to have to be immune before we uh, think that we have herd immunity. Herd immunity is like if there's somebody who cannot get the vaccine, they're surrounded by so many other people who are already immune that the virus cannot get through that, that herd, through all of the mama cows around that little calf. The virus cannot get, the lion cannot get through to that calf. That is what herd immunity right. is. And our estimates are going higher and higher as the new variants are becoming more and more infectious. The other thing is that even if we get things under control in the US, this is a global pandemic. Right. So right. we have to be concerned about what's happening for our brothers and sisters on the African continent, in Europe, Asia, in Australasia, all of these places. And in a way, in the US, we have been greedy and kind of bought up you know, so much of the early vaccine. And there are some African countries that are being told they won't get any vaccine until next year, 2022. We need to be about that politically. And um, the, the last thing I wanna say right now is that it is not because black people, I will say, I'm pretty sure that the primary reason that black people are not getting as much vaccine as our percent in the population or even our greater percent among those who are infected and dying. It's not because we're refusing it. I, I, I reject that. We have questions, but it's because the vaccine is not being put in our communities in ways that we can get it, right? I know there are some people who said, oh yeah, you know, in the health workforce, some people refused and all, but the, the primary reason is also that the phasing that the CDC proposed where the first phase was medical, you know, healthcare workers and nursing home people. The second phase was supposed to be other essential workers, but many states, most states I would say said, we'll take the 65 and up, which was supposed to be the third phase and add them to the first phase. So now you have older people who yes, by virtue of their age are more vulnerable, but we have people because of their work are more exposed and the 65 plus in the first phase is crowding out the essential workers. Great. Thank Great you very point. much. I mean, that Great was point. that you, you've again put the um, the context around all of this. And in fact, you know, in a way, addressed a couple of upcoming questions uh, <laughs> that uh, firstly to do with the individual who cannot take the, vi the, the, the vaccine decides not to or um, and, and then the issue of well, it actually end this pandemic, which has implications for uh, the, the, the pandemic outside of this country, right? As you've already mentioned. So anybody else want to comment on those two issues about deciding not to take the vaccine? There are people who for medical reasons or for personal reasons cannot be vaccinated. So how else can they uh, protect themselves? Or for, or for religious reasons. Oh, for religious know. reasons, yes. Yes, so we need to think about that as well. Uh, there's only really three ways to protect yourself. Uh, and that's the three W's. You got to wash your hands. You have to wear a mask. And you have to socially distance. You have to wait your, your distance. Really and truly, those are the three best preventive health mechanisms that we can do in order to mitigate the spread of this virus if you don't get the vaccine. I, I totally agree with Dr. Jones and, and with that, you know, I, I'd rather get the vaccine than to get COVID. Oh, gosh, yeah. But if there's a reason for why I can't get the vaccine, those are the three measures that I'm gonna continue to implement as well as stay home and shelter if, po if possible. That, that, that is so difficult for so many people uh, and for so many reasons, hopefully later we'll have an opportunity to talk about multi-generational housing and how that impacts the spread of COVID. Uh, but I, I don't want to I don't want to to uh, jump ahead of the line here. Yes. Okay. Well, I agree. I think that we have to. If, if someone decides not to get the vaccine for any reason, they have to double down 
on these things. Mm -hmm. They have to not only I'm going to do this, but they have to they have to absolutely double down on this. And um, and they have to you know not even associate with people who are not going to uh, no, not to not adhere. They have to. Um, but also, I think that there's some other areas. Number one, being as physically fit as possible is important. Having the best nutrition as possible. If one smokes, stop smoking because we know the damage that can take place with COVID-19 and, and lungs. Do those sorts of things that your doctor has been telling you to do, but you decided not to do. You've got to start doing and doubling down on that to keep yourself as healthy as possible in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of your life. Thank you. That's, that's very powerful. Let, let, me, let me just add one more point there, Dr. Valentine. I think what Dr. Lorenzen is talking about is a shift in our thinking about what health is. There's seemingly two paradigms of health. There is the reactive health that we have when we, we're healthy until something happens and it stops us from doing what we do. And then we access the healthcare system. And then there's the pre preventive health, which is we have our health, we want to maintain it. And so we do everything we do, everything we can not to have a issue. I believe that this vaccine gives us an opportunity to shift our paradigm and be more proactive about our health in our Black community. And that's why I think it's so important for, for us to take this vaccine. Thank you very much. I think that that is a profoundly state statement that uh, we should all take away with, take away the message from. So just to bring this part of this uh, discussion to the end, I'd like Dr. Jones to comment on what you would say to a person asking you the question, will taking the vaccine end the pandemic? Uh, what do you say? <laughs> taking the vaccine will, will protect you as an individual. Um, and for us to all end the pandemic, we have to double down, as we said, on the public health strategies. And we need to support th those government efforts to, to uh, cut down on the amount of virus that is transmitting, that's being spread uh, one to the other. That is the most important thing. As our, for ourselves, we can protect ourselves with the vaccine. We can protect others by wearing the mask. And we can protect the whole country by making sure that, for example, the relief package that's about to be proposed, that we you know, become politically active and reach out to our representatives and say that it has been too long that this uh, pandemic has been ignored as if it was going to magically vanish. The virus only has one job, and that's to replicate itself. And as long as it can find somebody who is vulnerable, somebody who's susceptible, somebody who either uh, you know, is not vaccinated or not protected, not hiding at home or whatever, it will keep spreading. It will burn through our population until it cannot find anybody else who's susceptible. So we have many things to do. We need to protect our own selves with the vaccine and we need to protect our community by cutting down the spread. And so we, there are so many people who are out there who can't shelter in place, but they could if we as a government made it more feasible. Great. So Hannah, there is another perspective in addition yeah. to that which Dr. Jones has just so brilliantly articulated. And that is the evidence of how important an intact and responsive public health system is for the health of our country. Part of our dilemma was a system that was fractured, that was slow to respond and really had no reserve capacity. And I think that as we focus on the vaccine, those of us that think about process recognize that it's not just the vaccine. We need to restore our public health enterprise with public health officials, with community clinics. We need to do stockpiling, uh, personal protective equipment. We need to understand that this is not the last pandemic that we will experience. And so the things that we can do to anticipate the next pandemic the decisions that we know we need to make early, particularly affecting travel, should be embedded in our mindset. These are the ways that we really tamp this down, not just vaccine, but public health is more important now than I think it's ever been over the last several decades. Amen. Thank and you. Dr. Yancey. I, I really do. I really do think that most of us sort of underestimated the importance of that. And 
and the need for a system, systematic approach to it and the devastation that has occurred uh, in the recent past to public health needs to be restored. Um, this session, as I said, very much focused on the vaccine, but you can see when you get smart people around, they're not just gonna talk about one topic because it's a complex issue. But I have to move this along as your moderator. And I'd like to bring up the question about, uh, sort of drill down a little bit about what vaccines are available now? What other vaccines? What are the range of uh, COVID-19 vaccines available? Do they work differently? Do they work at all? And very importantly, a question that is coming up frequently is, does the individual have a choice to which of these vaccines uh, to take? So uh, Dr. Lorenzen is gonna help us with that, those set of questions. Kato. Yeah, well, right now they're, they're available in the US right now, there are two vaccines. There's a Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, and they're based upon something called mRNA technology. And basically this, this you know, uh, a mRNA segment is actually wrapped in a nanoparticle that's made of a, of a fat or a lipid. It's taken up by the cells. The cells end up taking that mRNA and, and allowing you know, proteins to be made. Um, and those proteins are actually proteins that, uh, that, that are actually recognized as, as a part of, the, the, of the, uh, the virus, but it's not the virus itself. And of course, that's what builds the immune response. The, the, the body sees these little these protein particles and says, you know, for the first time and says, my goodness, this, you know, let's, 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 uh, Let's attack it, but it does it. The body attacks it on its own terms. If it attacks it without lots of virus particles replicating and doing a lot of damage, it does it on its own terms and then creates the memory, the muscle memory, as we say in sports. I'm a sports medicine doctor, as you know. The muscle memory, as we say, where if it comes again, it already has uh, the the cells and the and the and the factors that are already there waiting for it the next time it comes. Um, for the 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 other set of uh, the other technology uh, is the technology of AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson. And this is the more traditional technology where a virus called an adenovirus, which is you know which is very very weak, actually has a small segment of again some DNA that codes for that type of the protein in the virus, and that very very weak vi that very very weak virus is taken up by cells and again produces the the protein that's there and again. Uh, it really provides that muscle memory where the where it's excreted, they you know the 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 immune cells react to it, you know understand where it is, and then they remember that next time if it ever comes and challenge been this challenge before. The the uh, the the uh, Pfizer and the as we've talked about before, the Pfizer and the Moderna uh, uh, vaccines have about a ninety five percent effectiveness. Uh, uh, Dr. Yancey met with us, uh, we had our pre-meeting in which he stated it was 100% in terms of the study that, that, that was, was there for black people. There was a lot of incredulity by Dr. Bright um, and uh, who said, show me the data. Uh, and of course, which he off well says. And so that's why we open with that, with that data. And of course, uh, which, is, which, is, which is great because the, the specter of course is always that that, that these these results, 95% effectiveness, does that does that, can that apply to the black community? In some of our data, the data that Dr. Yancey uh, has shown that the this early data says yes, you know, and maybe even more, but certainly at that 95% level is a, is a confident nut level for the black community. Um, the AstraZeneca and the Johnson Johnson uh, uh, vaccines are are coming out. Not, it's not 100% clear what the where the efficacy level is, and uh, the one of the Johnson Johnson vaccine right now is a single shot vaccine. It may need a booster uh, in terms of uh, to, to to before before it finally comes out. But we'll need we'll need to see. Um, Dr. Yancey, do you have any thoughts? Any any comments or thoughts? It just uh, several hours ago, Cato. Um, it was announced that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the United States is about 60 to 70% effective, but importantly, 
It's 85% effective against the more serious consequences of COVID-19. And that really is a segue to make clear that we're not saying if you get the vaccines, you won't have anything that makes you feel ill at ease. It's just saying that you will be prevented from having the COVID-19 pneumonia from the more serious consequences. You may well have a viral syndrome. That is, you may feel flu-like, you might have a cold. And for certain, you can still transmit it. Another reason why we have to wear the mask. But this is all evolving as we speak. There is a vaccine, as we all know, in the UK that also is built on the adenovirus platform. And there's a vaccine out of China that's being used in Brazil. I don't know enough about the science for the vaccine out of China. But here is the other thing that we know with confidence. There are over 50 additional vaccines under development worldwide. And so this is a new dimension in our life and living. And we'll have to see how this all evolves. Will we find easier vaccines to make, easier vaccines to scale up in production, vaccines that are longer lasting? Think about Dr. Bright's comments earlier. These are the areas of the unknown. This is, this is such an exciting discussion, especially around these new ideas or these new technologies this messenger RNA, synthetic messenger RNA. I mean, all of us did biochemistry uh, as we did medical school and we learned about messenger RNA, which is essential for taking the message to the cells to make proteins. And now of course, uh, scientists can make synthetic ones that are specific and, and create a specific message to create those proteins and those antibodies to protect all, all, uh, all of us in these vaccines. But, you know, all of this sounds really, really costly, <laughs> right? You know, think of the investment that has gone into this and the companies and, um, so what does it cost, Dr. Yanzi? For the, in, for the have, end user. To, to get vaccinated. Yeah, I mean, for the end it? user receiving yeah. the vaccine, it's yeah. it's free. I mean, this may be the most egalitarian thing I've ever seen come out of our federal government industrial enterprise politics agnostic. But what will happen going forward? And to what extent will taxpayers still feel that it's part of our responsibility to support this? I worry that this will evolve and the responsibility of the cost shifting may occur, but for right now it's free. And I've had to answer that question as I've made the tour through my hospital, speaking to the essential workers, that no, you won't have to pay. You won't get a bill. It won't come out of your paycheck. These are real questions for people that are working hard and bringing limited dollars home to feed families. This is a real question and we're looking them in the eye and said, it's free. You know, let me just comment. I think that, that if we look at individuals in terms of vaccine hesitancy in the top five answers, obviously in terms of one of the top five is the cost. And I think that, that I think it is great with our country that, that, uh, that we've, we're, we've taken that off the table, at least right now it's off the table this year in terms of, you know, in terms of the providing the vaccine. The other question of course is, you know, should I, you know, should I, choose to get, should I wait and get, what vaccine, do I have a choice, et cetera? Exactly. As I've said in the very beginning, as a disclaimer, I'm a consultant for Johnson & Johnson and worked in terms of helping them with on their vaccine work. And uh, the Pfizer vaccine came out and they told me, what, what's, what's the vaccine Pfizer? I said, yeah, okay, fine, I'll, <laughs> let me get the Pfizer vaccine. And so um, that's just to underscore I think that you get what's available, and uh, and you get you know you, you you get in line and get what's available, and and you know it's not this is not a time to get real choosy about the vaccine that you're going to be able to get, and uh, all of them have gone through emergency use authorization. They've all been they've all had a process by which the ones that will be on the market for you to, to have a choose to choose from have had to have uh, have had uh, information and data that you know has on balance the, the FDA has decided that the benefits outweigh risks. So I, I think that getting you know whatever whichever one that, that you're, that's available at our institution, uh, the first week it was uh, there were Pfizer available. The second week there was Moderna, and it depends upon when you when you got it. And, and again, I think that it's it's whatever is available at the time. 
once you proceed. I think that some of the major, I understand I've talked to the people at uh, CVS um, and they will have the Pfizer vaccine uh, in about, about uh, in, in, in late March, early April uh, for broad distribution. And again, um, I think that people should get the, the vaccine that, uh, uh, that that's there when it's available. Thank you. I was looking for a specific answer like that to this question, because already, again, through the rumor mills, there's suggestions that, you know, one might be better than the other, wait and see, wait for this. And I don't think that's the message we want to give. We want to say, take what's available in your community and make sure you get vaccinated uh, quickly, get to the front of the line. But to yes. that point, but to that point, if you get a Pfizer vaccine, we want you to follow up with a Pfizer vaccine. If yeah. you get a Moderna, we want you to follow up with a Moderna. Yes. However, if it gets to a point where you don't have that second Pfizer or that second Moderna, you can interchange and get the other one. It's not recommended, but it can, it is, but it that it can work in that substitute manner. Okay. I also want to raise a question though. So the two vaccines that we have out here right now are extremely effective and equally effective. When we start getting others on, they might have different right. effectiveness. And I just knowing how things go down in this country can imagine that the that if one is thought to be less effective, those might be the ones that are flooding our communities where right now the the very effective ones are being disproportionately in the wider communities. Um, what do you guys think about that? It's a very real consi consideration. Yeah. I mean, we have a tremendous pattern of history, uh, which would that would suggest that that could possibly be the case. Uh, but uh, that's why we have to be vigilant about advocating for our communities. And that's what we, that's what the five of us do. And that's what we do in our communities. We advocate for us and we put out forums such as this to educate others so that they can advocate. Uh, so we, we need to continue to do that type of activities. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I can tell you something, uh, you, know, you know, I've thought about the same thing uh, and uh, you know, the, uh, one of the things that uh, my mother said, if you're black and you don't have a healthy sense of paranoia, you haven't been paying attention. So, um, and, and so we have, uh, you know, this is something that I've thought about too. And again, this, uh, there are, we're, this is something that we're watching. This is something I know this whole group is watching and to, as these are going and looking at the, you know, the, the, you know, the, the disparities that may be created by the system and watching it like a hawk and speaking out on it when, when we see it. Um, and so uh, this is very, very important. It's a very important uh, issue in question and something that we're all, that I'm looking at, we're all looking at and we're all thinking about in, in, in our minds. What is the hope that there will be a prioritization for vaccination that takes into account this massively increased risk uh, by race? That was already prescribed by the National Academy's uh, consensus study on an equitable you know, framework for the equitable allocation yeah. of vaccine against COVID-19. And when they, they said two things, they said there should be this phasing, which the CDC, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, that whole committee thing, they took that, but they never did pick up on the other important part, which is within each phase. If you're looking at nursing homes, but you don't have enough vaccine for all nursing homes all at once, which nursing homes get it first? And this committee said that we should be using a vulnerability index. We should be saying, who is the most needy? Who has been most impacted? The states, when they get their vaccine, should put the vaccine in those 25% most needy communities first. That has not been happening. Instead, it's in some places, it's almost been first come, first serve. And that's never going to be equitable when you talk about first come, first serve, because some people need to work. They can't be on the computer all day, may not even have a computer or know how to, to get in line. So, um, so I think that that we as a nation have fallen down on that, but we need to press because providing resources according to need is the core, one of the core things we need to do if we're gonna be about equity. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree somewhat, but I do believe that that we've got to get down to basics in terms of our community and encourage in terms of having black people um, uh, get the COVID-19 vaccine. I have seen, and I've seen data and I've seen, as Dr. Yancey has said, that even among health professionals and people who are eligible who are black, that there's a lower percentage and there has been documented a number of times that people who are you know, health professionals who have the access of it, who are black, are getting the vaccine at a lower rate. And, um, and it's a two-edged sword. I know that there were some, you know, the, that, that, uh, that the con one, there are a number of people who commented that, that black should maybe even come first because of our higher, higher rates. At the same time, many of the black people would say, wait a minute, you want us to come go first? Okay, well, <laughs> you go first this time. So I think that I, I think that just getting access, you know, getting getting you know the black people um, to 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 have the questions discussed and a comfort level in terms of getting a vaccine will go a long way in yeah. terms of the in terms of equity. And I I personally am not fighting to say black people should be in the front of the line, you know, for you know for vaccines. I just I think that we should have our fair share and fair shake in terms of moving forward. Uh, we should be monitoring any of the, any adverse events that are taking place. And, and I think if we do that uh, and we're diligent about that and make sure the vaccine is in our communities, that there are no you know, way stations in which they're not there and make sure it's the, the most efficacious vaccines in our communities, I think that, we'll be, that we can be successful. But I personally would like to see that gap that I alluded to in the vaccine rate compared to the case rates and the death rates closed, or at least narrowed. Right, you know, I right. think that's critically important. And I'm not, I don't know how to do that, but any opportunity I get, I'm going to be advocating for that. Uh, so I, let's I shift gears a little bit and um, address this question about, people ask if you're living in a house with multiple generation, why can't we all receive the vaccine at the same time? And, uh, and, and a related question, really, what is the difference between this vaccine and a flu shot? And Dr. Bright is going to help us through that, those two types of questions, those two questions. Cedric. Well, well thank you. And, and, and I think that Dr. Lorenzen kind of spoke to the aspect of the difference between the flu shot and, and this type of, uh, and, and the COVID vaccine. Uh, we know that the, the COVID vaccine is the MRA virus, uh, whereas the uh, flu vaccine is more of a polyvalent virus that is developed uh, and utilizes different technology, oftentimes uses eggs as a, or other type of embryonic uh, tissues in order to develop the vaccine. And so it has a different consist constituency of it compared to this COVID vaccine. Uh, and so that's that's the major differences is the science behind it and the platform for which the vaccine is developed. Uh, and those are the two major aspects. Uh, but getting to your point about um, the multi-generational uh, households, you know that African-Americans in, in, in the United States and Latina, uh, Latinx Americans, uh, actually live, have more of a propensity to live in multi-generational households. That means uh, it could be grandparents living with their children uh, and the children have kids. And so that's three generations. It could be a grandparent who's taking care of a, a older, uh, older adult, a younger adult uh, because they've come back to escape issues of the city or they're jobless because of the COVID situation and they brought kids with them. And so now there's three generations uh, and so, so forth and so on. And so the concern here is that if you are identifying one group to be more vulnerable, the older people in that household, um, but yet the younger people in that household may be the ones that are more of a threat to that older person. And with the vaccine not necessarily having what, 100%, you know, it, it would seem that in order to try to uh, mitigate the issues with all, for the whole household, that we would do a vaccination of multi-generational people within the household. Uh, and I don't know how much that has been discussed uh, in, in the national platforms. Uh, Dr. Jones, you may know some more about this, but it would seem to me that this was maybe something that was not thought about and has become more of an afterthought, uh, even though we knew this was an issue with COVID's outbreak. 
Right. Because I actually think it's a great idea. I know that in Georgia, a lot of those 65 year olds are able to also bring their caregivers, um, you know, to come back, get vaccinated with them. And so wow. if that's happening in your state, then everybody living up in that house is a caregiver. Right. Not that's, not, that's not happening in my state right now. That is not. In fact, we have people who are coming in from out of state and getting vaccinations in our state. Mm. And how they're getting on the list, I have no idea how they're doing that, but that's what's happening. You know, oh. there's always a way to game the system. Yeah. And those and we, that, that have those that have that ability will do it especially when it comes to survival. Because this is, this, as we say, this is like a Hunger Games. This is, this is a real life, true, like Hunger Games. That's why we have to recognize that this is a real protective tool. Sometimes we're acting like, oh, vaccine or not. This is like, they, we have to use all the tools we have against COVID-19 and the vaccine is a very good tool in our toolbox. It's not the only tool, but it's an important tool. And we can't let, um, those people who are better positioned to game the system do that on our health and on our bodies, no. Yeah. So Dr. Bright, while we have you on the, uh, on the stage there, um, um, I think as we come to a close uh, near the end of our session here, um, I wanna take the discussion back as a as sort of a wrap up to uh, addressing this mistrust which is very justified given the history uh, in this country of uh, medical various uh, issues and malpractices on blacks. Um, how do we really address this, um, uh, this issue of uh, hesitancy uh, in this community? We've talked a lot about uh, approaches, but would you like to just help us summarize what, where we need to be going with this? Well, you know, I, I, I think that we need to employ the 4A four, the four model. And the 4A model means to, to, to ask the question of the people. We need to acknowledge their answers. We need to address those answers. And then we need to affirm to them their validity to have those types of questions. And then once we do that, then we have to provide the information that dispels the misinformation. And then we have to do that from utilizing trusted voices. You know, we have a place of trustedness and then there's a place of who are the trustworthy people. We need to find our trustworthy people to deliver that message such that that message will be trusted. Mm -hmm. And so that would be kind of my quick answer to that. I'm, I'm very curious to hear what my colleagues have to say, because I'm sure they have an opinion on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. Yeah, any, any thoughts on this? Because it is a burning issue, as Cato has just recently uh, just pointed to. Yeah, but first of all, I can just say, wow, I think that, you know, Dr. Bright, that was uh, wonderful. That, you know, that summary is, is so on point. Um, you know, first of all, I think there are short-term and long-term things. One of the short-term things is obviously what we're doing. We we got we have the roundtable, and we have what you know. We, we the 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 goal of the roundtable is to create a group of trusted people, trusted voices in the area in the community for a lot of different issues. And and COVID nineteen is 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 one of them. And I think that that's one of the things that we've done. We also need to um, you know recognize that because of racism and discrimination. We just don't have a lot of black doctors here in America, and especially um, black male doctors, which are you know very very you know very very low. So we need to we we need the system to to acknowledge that, and we need to acknowledge what that means. That means that you've got you know that you've got less less trustworthiness in terms of the system because of that. We also know from a number of studies that uh, black physicians are more likely to treat black patients in terms of administer care. And now there's some interesting studies that have demonstrated in terms of informatality, cardiac care, that black physicians taking care of black patients, the outcomes are better. So I think that that we need as a system to acknowledge that and to make and to, to make changes to increase the number of black physicians uh, that are uh, that that are present. Just the concept of saying we're going to do that and moving forward, that is going to help in terms of building building trust in the system. 
Um, we need to employ um, black physicians as in terms of talking to the black community. I mean, I, I, I mean, I love, you know, tons of, you know, of, you know, rap artists and Nas and uh, shout out to Nas and other rap artists that are great. But I think that, you know, before we have, you know, you know, personalities to do that in the, you know, the, you know, in, in the majority of communities, we bring out Fauci to talk about issues. In the minority communities, we tend to bring out, you know, a, uh, a comedian to, to, to discuss issues. We need to, we need to look at our trusted sources in the black community of physicians. We've got, you know, the four people here that are with me are, are, are some of the, the, the greatest clinicians, scientists in, in the world, frankly. And so we need to, rely on these trusted you know, voices and and to and to bring those trusted voices out to be able to address these issues. That's a great, great point you make, uh, Cato. And it really sort of wraps it up as to why we have this uh, round table. And uh, COVID with all of its devastating consequences have really shone a light on all of these issues that will and should galvanize this work that, that, that we are doing. I think the big challenge is um, getting our voices heard. We have great voices, we have some numbers, but I think we still need to find a way to actually disseminate and amplify this trusted voice that we have. And that's what we've been talking about and will be working on, I, I believe. Um, any other comments before we wrap up here? If I may, um, we keep talking about how black folks have been are getting infected more and they're hospitalized more and they're dying more. And I just want to, we all know this, but just for the record, it's not just a happenstance. It's not because we're genetically different because we're more vulnerable because we don't know or whatever. It's because we're more likely to get infected because we're more exposed and less protected. And once infected, we're more likely to die because we're more burdened by chronic diseases with less access to health care. All of that has racism as its roots. And as Dr. Yancey said, this is not our last pandemic. And if we don't deal with how racism structures the conditions of our lives, structures our opportunities and, and assigns value so that we are thought to be essential but disposable, you know, um, if we don't address racism as a root cause, then when COVID-23 comes through, we're going to see the same disproportionate impact on Black communities and on and on. So right now we're talking about the vaccine and we're even talking about how racism might be interfering with the messaging we're getting and how the vaccine is distributed to us and all that. We need to address racism the vaccine reminds us, COVID reminds us, the murder of Mr. George Floyd reminds us. And so we need to address that as a community and be unafraid. We need to name racism. We have to figure out the levers on which we can intervene. And then we need to engage in collective action, organize and strategize to act. Collective action, all of us together, will not only protect us, it will propel us. Thank you very much. I think that sums it up brilliantly completely yeah. let me just also add i think it's so, so important to realize that this is not our last rodeo this is not our last rodeo and we will be you know that, that there will be something we'll be back again either with this or the next or something else and you're right we've got to we've got to address racism head on and if we don't do it now we'll never because if you know and and uh so I think it's gonna, it's so key in terms of making the structural changes that we need to make sure that the, the black community is not hit as hard as it is in terms of the, in terms of this. With that, I wanna thank you all for your wonderful participation in this webinar. Our work is cut out, but we are strong and we will succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you, Dr. Valentine, and thank you to the rest of the of the of the panel. Thank you.